In the last two videos, we covered predicate logic and scope ambiguity, and now we're going to take a look at how we can deal with these types of things in our fragment F2 of syntax. So if you haven't seen the F1 video, it's in the semantics and linguistics playlist. I'll try to put it in the description. So all of those rules will apply, all of our lexical entries will apply, but we're going to modify some and add some new ones to account for quantifiers, as well as pronouns, which we'll cover not in this video, but probably in the next one. So some new additions, we have some modifications for the first two rules that we see here. Now instead of an S just going to an N, we have different types of noun phrases now, so we can now branch an S off into an NP subject. For our transitive verbs with VPs, they will now have NP subjects or NP objects in there instead of just N objects. Now we have three different types of NPs that we can do. And we're going to have two variations depending on the quantifier. The first type that we have is just our proper names. So N with a subscript of P. So this would be where we put people like Jane or Tim or whatever name that we want. We'll have NPs that branch off into N pros, which are N pronouns. So this is where we have pronouns like he and she. Uh, these will need different types of rules than just uh, regular uh, proper names, so they'll have their own rules for those. And then for our different types of quantifiers, we're going to have our existential quantifier. So this will be a noun phrase branching into a word like a, some, or each. And then what we have on the other side are common nouns. So this would be something like book, or snail, or dog, or person, something like that. And then we have another rule for our universal quantifier. So all and every, and then another common noun that would be the same thing as in the each condition. So every dog, uh, all dogs, and so on. So in terms of our lexical entries, we're going to be having proper names, pronouns, and common nouns. So with proper names, it'll be the same as before. If we have Jane with some model and assignment function, we're just going to give them, say, a capital letter with a little apostrophe or a prime symbol to say that this is the individual or this is the variable that represents that individual in the world. With pronouns, let's say we get something like she. What we're going to do is we're going to plug this into our assignment function. So it would just be she in the assignment function. And the assignment function later would tell us what the value of g of she is. Maybe it's um, a constant, maybe it's a person, we don't know. This will be the same thing for traces. So if we ever have a trace in our tree, we're just going to put the trace into the assignment function and let that handle it. And we'll see that in action today. With terms of common nouns, if we have something like dog, for example, we know that common nouns act like predicates. So what this is going to be is this is going to be the set of x, such that x is a dog, and there are different members that could be in this set, uh, but this is what a common noun represents. So the different types of nouns that we have uh, show themselves in different ways, either an individual, something that goes into assignment functions, or as a predicate. So that's why we uh, do these differences here. Now we also have our quantifier raising rule, and what this is basically saying is that if we have a sentence, and somewhere in this sentence we have a quantified noun phrase, so this is like, say, every NC, and then maybe this is a VP with a VI here, what we're going to do is we take a look at our context, X and Y, they can be anything, so something to the left of the NP, something to the right, maybe they're both empty, what we do is we create a new S, we give it the index NPI, and what we're going to do is we're going to drag everything under that NP and move it upwards. And what's going to be left over in the case of the NP is a trace with that same index. So I'm just going to use T1 here, and then we'll call that NP1 just to be a little bit more consistent and not get it confused with VI. So this is what we saw in the scope ambiguity video. So let's see how this looks on a real sentence. So here's the sentence for Tina likes every book. If we want to do compositional semantics on this, what we see is that we have a noun phrase that has a quantifier in it, every book. So what we need to do 
is we need to take our sentence, create a new layer for our sentence, and give it a hosting site. So let's call this NP1. What we'll do is we'll drag everything under that quantified noun phrase, move it up into the new position. And now what we're going to get is in its place, a trace. So we would call that T1. And now you can imagine if we're evaluating the meaning of these sentences, uh, this is going to end up being G of T1. It's going to be a placeholder for quite some time. And then when we get to this node up here, we'll be able to finally evaluate it because we're going to have a meaning for one at some point. So this is how we do quantifier raising. And why we do this is so that it's closer to the predicate logic translation. Because if we say every, uh, so Tina likes every book, what we're saying is that for all X, if X is a book, then we have the predicate likes and Tina is going to like that X. So what you can see here is that this bit of the predicate is being moved up to be at the front and we get our indexing. So with X and X here, this is going to be indexed by T1 in the lower bit. And then we're going to have our NP1 in the higher bit to uh, join those meanings together. So this is why we do quantifier raising. And you can imagine if you have two quantified NPs in a sentence, you would have two different structures. So you'd be moving up each NP once into its own position. But we're just going to talk about one quantifier here. So. Let's introduce our two new rules, and this is going to be very similar to our translations. So let's say we have a sentence like for all X, I'm just going to use a noun here. So if X is a common noun, then maybe we have our predicate say likes CX. We need to have some rule that looks like this. So if we have our form like this, so S1 is branching to an index NP that's quantified and it breaks off into a sentence below. So this is every, this is the universal here. This is going to be true if for every D in our universe, so if I just highlight some of this here, for all D in our universe corresponds to this for all X, we say that if D is in our common noun set, so if X has the property of being that noun, then what's going to happen is our predicate is going to be true. But we're doing something here. If you take a look at this bit right here, this is going to get a little bit ugly on the screen. What we're doing is we're doing an assignment function replacement. So we're saying we're replacing D with TI. So what this is going to do now is when we plug things into this, we now have a relationship between for all D in our universe, if D is in that noun, then instead of you know the sentence with TI being in there with a the trace, we're replacing all the traces with the Ds, so that way they correspond to each other. So what this would look like is for all D, if D is a noun, then T likes D. Okay, and then for the case of for some, uh, this is going to be our existential rule down here. And this will be true if for some D in our universe, D is in the noun set and the sentence with D replacing our TI, our trace will be true. So this just corresponds, corresponds to the fact that we'd have exists in X such that X is a noun and whatever our predicate was before, let's say likes uh, TX is equal to true. And because we have the and here, we're gonna have the and there. So this is just to match our predicate logic translation. So at this point, it's a little bit abstract, I know. So let's see this in a real example. So here we have the sentence from before, Tina likes every book, but we've done quantifier raising on this. Now let's show all of our rules. So uh, I'll do this in yellow, and we know we'll start on the very right here. So if we have a trace, what this is going to be is this is going to be the assignment function for T1. So we're not evaluating it yet. We don't know what T1 maps to, but if we're doing quantifiers, eventually we're going to replace T1 with a D or a D prime or something so we can evaluate it later. Now, in terms of 
uh, node having just one daughter, we know that this is going to just take the same meaning as the daughter below. So this will be g of t1 as well. In terms of our transitive verbs, nothing is going to change compared to before. So the meaning of likes, well, likes is transitive, so it's going to be a pair of x, y, such that x likes y. So that'll be the meaning for that. And if we pass it up to the transitive verb, it's going to be the same meaning there. So I'll just copy and paste it and move it up for the sake of completion. And I'll lower this arrow a little bit just to make sure that there's room. So now when we get to our verb phrase, nothing is going to be different. So we're going to do the same thing as we did before. We're now taking our object here. We're plugging it into the Y position, and then we're going to get rid of that Y in the set that we're looking for because now we have our direct object. So instead of putting a name like Tina in there, we're just going to have an assignment function, but everything's going to be the same as it was before. So now we're looking for the set of X such that X likes G of T1, and that'll be that. We just don't know specifically what our direct object is at the point but we do know it's a trace and that it's going to be um, figured out eventually. So now we have our verb phrase done uh, in terms of uh, our noun here. I'll just do this in a slightly different color so things don't overlap too much. Uh, the meaning of Tina, we're just going to give capital T with a prime symbol and say that stands for Tina in the real world. And now with our pass up rule here, it's just going to take the same meaning as its daughter Tina. So this will also be T prime and same for this noun phrase here, the model and assignment function, this will just be T prime as well. So now when we get to our sentence S, well, again, it's going to be the same as before. Everything up to this point is quite boring. It's very similar to F1. So this is a sentence. It's going to have a truth value. It's going to be true if and only if T prime or subject is in the set of x such that x likes g of t1. Okay, now we need to introduce our quantified noun phrase. So to start this, there's a couple things that we should probably do. We should take note of which quantifier it is. It's every so we know which rule to apply. But we should also take a look at the meaning of our common noun here. So this is book. And we know that book is going to act like a predicate. So this is going to be the set of X such that X is a book. Okay, so that's nice. And we can still apply the same pass up rule here. So if we have a common noun, what we can do is we can take the same node at its daughter here, which is book. Uh, we can make this line a little bit shorter to fit it in. And we can say, okay, it's the set of X such that X is a book. So what do we have here? Well, we have every set of X such that X is a book, and then we have another sentence. So this is where we're going to use our new rule. And I will do this in a different color in case there's some overlap here. So we need to combine our every NP with the S here. So this is an every statement. So this is going to be true if and we're going to introduce a new variable here. So if for all D in our universe, because we're talking about every something, we're going to say that if D is an element of our quantified noun phrase here, so the set of X such that X is a book, then what's going to happen? Well, then we're going to say that S2 so in this case, if we can just give these numbers so I can separate them very easily, S1 and S2, then S2 is going to be true, but we're going to be replacing our trace with that variable. So if D is in the set of X such that X is a book, we're just going to repeat our S2. So then T prime is going to be in the set of X such that X likes. But now we know what G of T1 is going to be because we have this index here 
for x as a book. We have the index here on t1. So wherever we see g of t1, we're going to replace it with the variable that we introduced, which would be d in this case. So our final truth condition is going to be it's true if for all d in our universe, if d is a book, then Tina is in the set of x such that x likes d, and d just happens to be that book. So with the if-then statement, we get our every translation, and with d's, we're now relating our book to the position in the trace. And this should make sense when we think about the predicate logic translation. So for all x, if x is a book, that's like saying if for all d, if d is in the set of books, then our predicate will be true with d replacing whatever the trace is, and which is going to be the same thing as saying here that Tina is in the set of x such that x likes d and d is our book. So this can be a little bit confusing at first, but again, you just need to follow the rules and then everything comes out nicely. Don't forget about quantifier raising. Don't forget about how to translate every and each. And if you ever get stuck, just think about the predicate logic translation, and that can really help you out when trying to determine how to do these. So in the next video, we'll do uh, pronouns, which are very similar to just evaluating traces. So uh, if if you're interested in that, stay tuned for the next one. If you have any questions, you know what to do, put them down below. Thanks for commenting, subscribing, liking, all that other fun stuff. And I hope to see you in the next one.